Volume 2, Chapter 212, 8th of July, 1945. At Juta, Jesus speaks in Isaac's house. The whole population of Juta has run to meet Jesus with the wild flowers picked on the mountain sides and the early fruits they cultivate, besides the smiles of the children and the blessings of the citizens. And before Jesus can set foot in the village, he is surrounded by the good people who, warned by Judith of Kerioth and by John, sent ahead as messengers, have rushed with what they found best to honor the Savior, and above all, with their love. Jesus blesses with gestures and words both adults and young people who press against him, kissing his tunic and hands, and lay sucklings in his arms, so that he may bless them with a kiss. The first to do so is Sarah, who places against his heart the beautiful ten-month-old baby, whose name is Jezai. Their love is so impetuous that it prevents progress. And yet it is like a rising wave. I think that Jesus proceeds carried more by that wave than by his own feet, and his heart is certainly carried very high, into the clear sky, by the joy of such love. His face shines with the brightness of the moments of greatest joy of man-God. It is not the powerful magnetic-looking face of the moments when he works miracles, nor the majestic face as when he discloses his continuous union with the Father, nor the severe one when he condemns sin. They all sparkle with different lights, but the present one is the light of the hours of relaxation of his old ego, assailed from so many sides, compelled to be always vigilant of every slightest gesture or word, both of his own or of others, surrounded by all the traps of the world that, like a malefic cobweb, throw their satanic threads around the divine butterfly of the man-god, hoping to paralyze his flight and imprison his spirit, so that he may not save the world, to gag his word, so that he may not instruct the supreme guilty ignorance of the earth, to tie his hands, the hands of the eternal priest, so that they may not sanctify man, depraved by demon and flesh, to dim his eyes, so that the perfection of his look may not attract hearts to himself. His look, in fact, is a magnet, forgiveness, love, charm overwhelming every resistance that is not the resistance of a perfect Satan. Oh, is the work of the enemies of the Christ still not always the same against the Christ? Science and heresy, hatred and envy, the enemies of mankind, who sprang from mankind itself like poisoned branches from a good tree, do they not do all that, so that mankind may die, as they hate it more than they hate the Christ? Because they hate it in an active way, unchristianizing it in order to deprive it of its joy, whereas they can bereave Jesus of nothing, as he is God whilst they are dust. Yes, they do that. But the Christ takes shelter in faithful hearts, whence he looks, speaks and blesses mankind, and then, and then he gives himself to those hearts, and they, and they touch heaven with his blessedness, still remaining here, but burning their senses and organs, in their feelings and thoughts, and in their souls to the extent of being delightfully tortured in their old being. Tears and smiles, groans and songs, exhaustion and dire urgency for life are our companions. More than companions, they are our very being, because as bones are in the flesh, and veins and nerves are under our skin, and they all make one man, thus, likewise, all these burning things originating from the fact that Jesus gave himself to us, are within us, in our poor humanity. And what are we in those moments which could not last forever? Because if they lasted a few moments longer, we would die burnt and broken. We are no longer man. We are no longer the animals gifted with reason living on the earth. We are, we are, oh Lord. Let me say it once, not out of pride, but to sing your glories because your glance burns me and makes me rave. We are then seraphim, and I am surprised that we do not emit flames and fierce heat perceptible by people and matter, as it happens in the apparitions of damned souls. 
because if it is true that the fire of hell is such that even the reflection emitted by a damned soul can set a piece of wood on fire and melt metals, what is your fire like, O God, in whom everything is infinite and perfect? One does not die of fever. One does not burn because of it. One is not consumed by the fever of bodily diseases. You are our fever, love. And by it we are burnt, we die, we are consumed, and the fire of our hearts, which cannot resist so much, are torn apart by it and for it. But I express myself badly, because love is delirium. Love is a waterfall that shatters dams and descends, knocking down everything that is not love. Love is the thronging in the mind of sensations, which are all true and present, but no hand can write them down, as the mind is so fast in translating the feeling of the heart into thoughts. It is not true that one dies. One lives. Life is decoupled. One lives a duplicated life, as a man and as a blessed soul, the life of the earth and that of heaven. Oh, I am sure of it. One achieves and exceeds a life without faults, without restrictions and limitations, that you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you, God Creator, one in trine, had given to Adam a prelude to the life, after ascending to you, to be enjoyed in heaven, following a placid transition from the earthly paradise to the heavenly one, a transfer made in the loving arms of angels, like the sweet sleep and assumption of Mary into heaven, to come to you. One lives the true life. Then one finds oneself here, and as I am doing now, one is amazed and ashamed of going so far, and one says, Lord, I am not worthy of so much. Forgive me, Lord. And one beats one's breast, because we are terrified at having been proud and a thicker veil is lowered over the splendor, because if it does not continue to blaze with overwhelming ardor, out of pity for our limitation, it gathers in the center of our hearts, ready to blaze once again in a mighty way for another moment of blessedness wanted by God. The veil is lowered on the sanctuary, where the fire, the light and love of God are burning, and exhausted and yet regenerated, we resume going like people inebriated, with a strong, sweet wine that does not dim reason, but prevents us from having eyes and thoughts for what is not the Lord. You, my Jesus, ring linking our misery to divinity, means of redemption for our sin, creator of blessedness for our souls. You, Son, who with your wounded hands put our hands in the spiritual ones of the Father and of the Spirit, that we may be in you, now and forever. Amen. But where have I been while Jesus inflames me, inflaming the people of Judah with his loving glance? You may have noticed that I no longer speak of myself, or I do so only seldom. How many things I could say! But the tiredness and physical weakness, which oppress me immediately after dictations, and spiritual modesty, which grows stronger and stronger the more I proceed, convince me and compel me to be silent. But today, I went too high, and, we know, the air of the stratosphere makes one lose one's control. I went much higher than the stratosphere, and I could not control myself any more. And I think that if we always kept quiet, we who are caught in these vortices of love, we would end up by deflagrating like projectiles, or rather, like overheated or closed boilers. Forgive me, Father. And now let us go on. Jesus enters Juta and is led to the market square and then to the poor little house where Isaac languished for thirty years. They say to him, We come here to speak of you and to pray, as in a synagogue, the most true one. Because it is here that we became acquainted with you and hear the prayers of a saint have asked you to come to us. Come in and see how we have arranged the place. The little house, 
which the previous year consisted only of three tiny rooms, the first one where Isaac, a sick man, begged, the second, a lumber room, and the third, a kitchenette which opened onto the yard, is now one room only with benches in it for those who meet there. The few household implements of Isaac have been placed, like so many relics, in a little hut in the yard, and the respectful people of Juta have made the yard less dreary looking, as they have planted there some climbing plants, which now cover the rustic stockade with their flowers and form an incipient pergola, growing on a network of rope stretched out over the yard, at the height of the low roof. Jesus praises them and says, We can stop here. I only beg you to give hospitality to the women and to the boy. Oh, Master, that will never be needed. We will come here with you and you will speak to us, but you and your friends are our guests. Grant us the blessing of giving you and the servants of God hospitality. We only regret that they are not as many as the houses. Jesus agrees and leaves the little house going towards that of Sarah, who will not cede to anybody her right to entertain Jesus and his friends at a meal. Jesus is speaking in Isaac's house. The people crowd the room and the yard and throng also the square, and Jesus, in order to be heard by everybody, stands in the middle of the little room so that his voice will carry both in the yard and in the square. He must be dealing with a subject brought on by a question or an event. He says, But have no doubt. As Jeremiah says, They will find out at the test how sorrowful and bitter it is to abandon the Lord. Neither potash nor lye can remove the stain of certain crimes, my friends. Not even the fire of hell can corrode that stain. It is indelible. Also here, we must acknowledge the justice of Jeremiah's words. Our great ones in Israel really looked like the wild she-asses mentioned by the prophet. They are accustomed to the desert of their hearts, because, believe me, as long as one is with God, even if one is as poor as Job, even if one is alone, even if one is nude, one is never alone, poor or nude, one is never a desert. But they have rejected God in their hearts, and thus they are an arid desert. Like wild she-asses, they sniff in the air the smell of males, which in our case, because of their lust, are named power, money, as well as true and proper lechery, and they follow that smell as far as crime. Yes. They follow it, and will follow it, even more so in future. They do not know that their hearts, not their feet, are exposed to the darts of God, who will avenge their crime. How confused kings, princes, priests, and scribes will be, because they really said, and still say to what is nothing, or worse, is sin. You are my father. You have begotten me. I solemnly tell you that Moses, in a fit of anger, broke the tables of the law when he saw the people in idolatry. Later he climbed the mountain, prayed, adored, and obtained grace. That happened centuries ago. But idolatry has not yet died in the hearts of man, and will never rest. On the contrary, it will rise, like yeast and flour. Almost every man now has his own golden calf. The earth is a forest of idols, because every heart is an altar, but hardly ever there is God upon it. Who is not a slave of one evil passion is slave of another, and who has not one wicked desire has another with a different name. Who has no greed for gold has a greed for positions. Who has no lust for the flesh is another egoist. How many egos are worshipped in hearts like golden calves? The day, therefore, will come when they are struck, and they will call the Lord, and will hear him reply, Go to your gods. I do not know you. I do not know you. 
a dreadful word when uttered by God to man. God created the race of man, and he knows each individual. If he therefore says, I do not know you, it means that by the power of his will he has erased that man from his memory. I do not know you. Is God too severe because of that verdict? No. Man cried to heaven, I do not know you, as faithfully as an echo. Consider, man is obliged to acknowledge God out of gratitude and out of respect for his own intelligence. Out of gratitude. God created man and granted him the ineffable gift of life and provided him with the super ineffable gift of grace. When man lost grace to his own fault, he heard a great promise being made to him. I will give grace back to you. It is God, the offended party, who says to the offender, as if he, God, were guilty and obliged to make amends. And God keeps his promise. Behold, I am here to give grace to man. God has not confined himself to giving only what is supernatural, but he has lowered his spiritual essence to provide for the coarse necessities of man's flesh and blood, and he gives the heat of the sun, the relief of water, corn, vines, all kinds of trees and all races of animals. Thus men received from God all the means of life. He is the benefactor. Man must be grateful and show his gratitude by endeavoring to know him. Out of respect for one's own reason. A madman and an idiot are not grateful to those who cure them, because they do not understand the true value of the cure. And they hate those who wash them and feed them, who accompany them and put them to bed, who watch that they do not get hurt, because beastly as they are on account of their illness, they mistake cures for tortures. The man who fails in his duties towards God disgraces himself, a being gifted with reason. Only a fool or an idiot cannot tell his father from a stranger, a benefactor from an enemy. But an intelligent man knows his father and his benefactor and takes pleasure in knowing him better and better, also with regard to things of which he is unaware, as they happened before he was born or before he was helped by his father or benefactor. That is what you must do with the Lord to show that you are intelligent and not brutes. But too many people in Israel are like those fools who do not know their father or their benefactor. Jeremiah asks, Can a girl forget her ornaments and a bride her sash? Oh, yes. Israel is made of such foolish girls, of such wanton brides who forget honest ornaments and sashes to put on tinsels of prostitutes. And this is found to happen more and more frequently the more one climbs the classes that should be the teachers of the people. And God's reproach, with his wrath and regret, is addressed to them. Why do you endeavor to prove that your behavior is good to obtain love, whereas you teach the wickedness of your ways of living, and the blood of poor and innocent people was found on the hems of your garments? My friends, distance is good and evil. To be very far from the places where I am likely to speak is an evil, because it prevents you from hearing the words of life. And you regret it. That is true. But it is good inasmuch as it keeps you away from the places where sin ferments, corruption boils, and snares hiss to act against me, hampering me in my work and against the hearts of people by insinuating doubts and falsehood with regard to me but I prefer you to be far away rather than corrupted. I will see to your formation. You know that God had provided before we were acquainted with one another, so that we might love one another. I was known before we met. Isaac was your announcer. I will send many Isaacs to speak my words to you. However, you must know that God can speak everywhere and privately to the spirit of man and instruct him in his doctrine. 
Do not be afraid that by being alone you may be led into error. No. If you do not want, you will not be unfaithful to the Lord and to his Christ. On the other hand, he who just cannot stay away from the Messiah should know that the Messiah opens his heart and stretches out his arms to him and says, Come. Come, whoever wishes to come. Stay here, whoever wishes to stay. But both the former and the latter should preach Christ by means of an honest life. Preach him against the dishonesty which nestles in too many hearts. Preach him against the levity of the numberless people who do not know how to persevere faithfully and forget their ornaments and sashes of souls called to the wedding with Christ. You said to me in your happiness, Since you came here, we have had neither sick nor dead people. Your blessing has protected us. Yes, health is a great thing. But make sure that my present coming makes you all wholesome spiritually, always and in everything. To that effect, I bless you and I give my peace to you, to your children, to your fields, crops, homes, herds, and orchards. Make a holy use of them. Do not live for them, but by them, giving what is superfluous to those in need, and you will thus obtain an overflowing measure of the Father's blessings and a place in heaven. You may go. I will stay here to pray. 9th of July I am reading again what I wrote yesterday, rewriting some incomprehensible words, out of pity for your eyes, Father. It is distressing to read it. It is so inferior to what I felt while describing my mood. And yet, to be helped to say what the Lord made me feel, lest I should describe it badly, and also for my own relief. Because it is also painful, you know. I invoked my Saint John. I said to him, You know these things very well. You experienced them. Help me. And I was comforted by his presence, by his smile of an eternal, good, simple-minded man, and by his caress. But now I feel that my poor word is so inferior to the feelings I experienced. All human things are straw. Only the supernatural is gold. And a human being cannot even describe it. 